You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by QuickStrike, options pricing and analysis software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X dot com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling the funk from that tune, one of my favorite tunes on the old network. You know, we're wrapping up the week here when you hear that tune. And you know, it's time for TWIFO this week in futures options, as the name implies. This is the show where we break down all of the hot, the amazing, the head scratching, sometimes weird and wonderful action going on on the other side of the fence, the futures options side of the fence. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from this here old network. And if you guys like this show, we hit this one up. We also do a lot of other stuff that touches on this, including volatility views, where we touch on commodity vol quite a bit, occasionally on the advisors, options, some of the other programs like Options Bootcamp as well. You can find all of that goodness via the easiest place is just go to wherever you find our programming. Just subscribe to our main network feed. It'll just say Options Insider Radio Network, and then you get it all right there, delivered to your inbox, to your RSS player, your pod catcher of choice, However you like to get it, it's all delivered there. And then you can pick your poison. I want to listen to this one today. I want to listen to that one today. I want to listen to all of them today. If you got a long commute, we can help you out. If you got a shorter commute, you got to pick and choose. We understand whatever, whatever floats your boat. We're happy to have you in there. And, of course, however you listen to us, including via our mobile app, which is available on all the major outlets, uh, we make sure you hit us up with your questions, your comments. Uh, we do love to hear from you guys at the end of the day. You're the reason we do this. So if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have insights, pearls of wisdom for us, hit us up. Website, questions at theoptionsinsider.com, add options on Twitter or stock twits. Uh, you know how to find us. And it's all baked into the mobile app as well to make your life even easier. And joining me on the old Twifo yet again, not from parts unknown, but actually from the Quick Strike World Global Nay Interstellar HQ. It's Mr. Nick Howard, the founder of Bantix Technologies and creator of a little 
platform we like to use around here called Quick Strike. Mr. Nick, welcome back to the show. Glad you could join us from the Interstellar HQ. Yes, we're out in here in the Western Suburbs HQ, so not quite uh, the stratosphere or interstellar, but uh, you know, far out there nonetheless. Yes, all the way out there, past uh, past Neptune, all the way out to Uranus and beyond. You see the Interstellar HQ <laughs> of Quick Strike. Okay, Nick, a lot of stuff to talk about today. Bad uh, bad jokes aside, uh, let's get into some of the hot action. We got to start. I think uh, I think. Pretty much uh, where we start a lot these days, but it's kind of the reason is is because kind of that's kind of where the action is uh, yet again out there in crude. It was kind of a uh, an interesting week out there in all things WTI. You know, we saw a lot of uh, back and forth dance out of OPEC. We've been seeing that for a while. They announced that kind of I guess you can call it a free slash cut, but they've been having uh, some issues actually implementing that. We saw on the initial rumors of that a while back. We saw it break finally WTI break finally over the fifty handle kind of dance around there for a little bit, then kind of sell off back down to uh, the mid to low 40 handle again, depending on where you're looking out there on the term structure, and then kind of rally back again towards the end of the week. So it's been an interesting week to kind of keep an eye on this stuff. Net on the week, uh, the futures kind of settled up about two to two and a half handles, again, depending where you're looking out there. It's somewhere in the in the 46 to 48, lar- farther out, so beyond June, uh, you are, again, up in around the 50 handle again, so you're floating with those levels. Uh, but it's kind of all been uh, been laid at the feet of these these OPEC deal and the, the difficulties, as we all knew, would come <laughs> with implementing an actual production cut. Uh, you know, because these companies, these countries, at the end of the day, they got to keep printing, <laughs> printing or pumping, in this case, oil to print money. And they have a, a bit of a reluctance to not do that. And so OPEC sometimes working against its own best interests at the end of the day and what was lighting it up out there in terms of before we even get to that let's get into what we saw from a vol perspective kind of a mixed bag uh, in the nearer portion of the curve even i hate to you know the front month future uh, it has about nearly a month ago so it's a little bit more uh, a little bit more a little bit more longer term than a weekly as it was last time obviously uh that was up about uh, about two and a half percent we saw a little bit of vol pop out there about three points but again front month vol is a little bit more of a variable beast uh, yeah, and kind of a tale of two uh, two cities as you get farther out down the curve where longer-term vol actually seemed to come off a little bit, and that kind of reflects, I think, what we've been seeing for a while out here now where still the structural concern, still the higher levels of implied volatility are out there in the put wing. And so when you move away from the put wing in general out here in crude, vol tends to come off. Uh, but sometimes in the nearer portion, when people are in the front month and couple and first couple of months out there, People have been gobbling up some calls at an aggressive pace, less so farther out, obviously. So when we're seeing that, we're seeing, and then that's why I think we see this discrepancy where the front month has a bit of a gain from a vol perspective, and then because uh, it's a little bit steeper from a call skew perspective, and a little bit, a little bit shallower. The farther out you go out there, of course, we can delve all into quick skew, and you guys can see all that for yourself in a little bit. And I'll let Nick uh, run with that a little bit as well. He is the 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 arbiter of all things. Quick skew over there. By the way, I forgot to mention top of the show. You guys can always join us every Friday, 3 p.m. Central via Mixler, M-I-X-L-R. We tweet that link out uh, all the time every week. If you tweet, if you've seen it before, you know it's the same link. So just hop on board. Love to see you in there asking questions, giving Nick a hard time, all that fun stuff. Of course, you can always follow along with the reports as well whenever you're listening to the show, live or after the fact, heading on over to cmegroup.com slash Twio. Forget the F. Leave off the F for fun this week in options as opposed to this week in futures options. And then uh, you can generate these reports, at least most of this detail we're talking about here, uh, pretty much yourself and pretty much for free, which is a pretty cool thing. All right, moving on to where the action was a little bit broader than it has been lately. You know, WTI has been very, very front heavy, two thirds or so of the volume going up in the front month, this time a little bit less, only about half, just a tick over 50 percent coming in that uh, front a Jan contract, which is interesting. That shows a little bit more spread. And again, kind of reflecting what we we're saying earlier uh, with uh, the Feb and other contracts getting a little bit of love as well. The ball, ball coming up and getting a little bit of action, about 20, uh, about a little bit less than 20, about 19% in the Feb and going out to March about 15%. So a nice, healthier spread than we've seen in some recent weeks here. And talking about what was lighting it up out there. Number one with a bullet out here, the hot option this week in all things WTI was the Jan 50 call, lighting it up uh, pretty much all week. The weakest day being today, only about 3,900, but a total 
of about 33, nearly 34,000 going up out there today, or excuse me, this week, uh, about 6,000 on Monday, and then about nearly nine both days, Tuesday and Wednesday. Again, that's where a lot of the, uh, the back and forth action was out there in WTI this week, and then a little bit lighter, about 6,000 on Thursday. So a decent smattering uh, throughout the week, and that was clearly number one. Number two, though, not that far behind, again, on the call side, uh, are the Jan 20 excuse me, Jan 46 calls with 29,000 of those going up this week, about 16 of that 29 going up on Tuesday. So very much loaded on one day, only 400 and change going up on Thursday. So not as evenly spread out throughout the week. Clearly a big frenzy going up out there on Tuesday. And also a lot of them are opening, uh, which is kind of interesting. So a lot of opening activity on the Jan 46s. And then you then you get a little bit uh, still. It was pretty much uh, it was a Jan call strip this week. This is where the hot options, uh, the hot activity was. The Jan 55s, the Jan doubles, also lighting it up to the tune of 28,000, 10,000 of those. So about a third coming on Wednesday. Uh, so an interesting mix out here. And a lot of those, nearly half of those opening on Wednesday as well. And 8,000 going on the Tuesday. So Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, the hot days for a lot of these, uh, these contracts. That they're not entirely surprising on that front. Again, about 28,000 open total. Those are the top three kind of products we saw lighten it up out here this week. Open interest up a fairly a fairly significant amount, about 12, 12 and a half percent actually this week, up to 213, up, excuse me, up 213,000 contracts. So again, an aggressive week volume wise, volatility wise, and a lot of the action still, Mr. Nick, out there in, uh, in the call wing, at least in the front month in Jan. Hence, that's why we saw some bidding up out there in the Jan contract from a ball perspective. Uh, what's your take and what's, your, what's catching your eye out there uh, from a quick skew perspective in crude, sir? Well, I just, uh, I just sh uh, tweeted a uh, January quick skew chart for uh, uh, three months, and uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But I think uh, what's catching my eye the most, when, if you start to dive into some of these uh, most active links to see what, uh, what happened uh, this week, uh, like you like you mentioned briefly, you're seeing a lot of green uh, in terms of the change in open interest across a lot of different strikes. And I think what's uh, what's what's catching my eye really here is uh, the majority of the trade is you know in, we're between the 40 and 60 range, and and it's probably even tighter between the uh, you know the 40 and 55. So you're you're seeing a lot of trade within this within this range uh, of strikes. And and like we've been talking about for weeks now, you know we've said how it's the 40 to the 50 range. And and for a while earlier this week, it looked a little bit scary when we, we started to break down uh, below 43, uh, and then everything sort of came back again. So, um, you know, a pretty diverse uh, uh, opening of strikes. Um, well, not opening, uh, increased open interest of strikes. Now, remember, December went off this month, so there's probably, a, or this week, so there's probably a lot of rolling into the January contract. But, um, you know, a lot of trade within the, the 40 and 50 range, which is what you expect. And not a lot of, not a lot of flyers uh, from a strike standpoint. You know, the, the, the farthest out strike in the high, high volume uh, trades uh, this week is the 60 strike in the Jan. You're seeing a little bit uh, more, um, uh, you know, a little bit more range further out. But uh, like uh, if we go out as far as like the July contract, we see some 20 puts trade. Which is a pretty uh, a pretty oddball. You see some 35 puts trade out in December, even some hundreds and 95s as well. But I think what's really what really catches my eye is just you know the continued increased open interest, especially in the January and the February contracts, and that's going to be with uh, the people that were in these rolling into these new front month contracts. But then just the continued open interest in the WTI across the board, uh, 11 or 12 percent. You know, if you're looking at uh, Twio, you're going to see 12% in a blue row down to the bottom, which is just what's showing. And then uh, in the light green up on top, that's across all the expirations that we are tracking. And I think we're doing like three and a half years of the 10 that are out there. So um, just a w pretty widespread uh, trade. Uh, so a lot of volume and a lot of different strikes, which is always good. So that means there's some activity and there's some things you can do there from a trading standpoint. As far as the skew, you're, you, everybody who's looking or can see, you'll notice that it's green. Um, for the 25 delta risk reversal in the Jan, the Feb, uh, in particular, the rest, I'll, I'll call it flattish. Anything less than a half, I'm going to call flattish. But um, uh, about a 1% change in the in the 25 delta risk reversal. And that's coming from uh, an increase uh, in the call 
volatility and a decrease in the put volatility for this week. So we're seeing a little bit of a tightening. And if you look at the tweet that went out there, you'll see that the, the channel is sort of narrowing a little bit. And and for a 27 day option, you know, that's actually it's it's a, it's a pretty good time to start narrowing there. So uh, if we if we look at uh, some of the longer dated stuff, if we take a look at what the, uh, February looks like. Um, and we take a look at the the quick skew there as well. We're going to see. Um, let's see what we got from a historical standpoint there. If I look at here, here we go. Uh, if I'm looking at that quick skew as well, um, we're seeing a narrowing there as well. So the fact that we're narrowing as we go further out on the term structure, that's uh, you know that's a little bit of a sign that. Um, you know that there's might be a little bit of a change in pattern in terms of what becomes uh, of interest but like we've been saying for weeks we are still trading in a range here and we talked even though vol's up uh, in this front contract we still talk about you know you can safely you could have safely been short the 40 50 strangle again and, and probably uh and probably uh done okay without doing too much so um you know catching the eyes always we like to look for the for the high volume, so we're seeing a big volume. We didn't see a, a, a tremendous change in the put call ratio. Uh, we saw well, some, some maybe, uh, but not not a tremendous amount, and still, you know, increased open interest across the board. Let's mix it up a little bit this week, uh, Mr. Nick. We usually dive into gold here. I think we'll we'll pivot a little bit just because there's some action in some other areas. I don't know if you call this really a surprise product. We have talked about it before, and it is a, uh, a hot product out there. To talk about these days, but let's get into, uh, particularly with uh, Deese and our friend Miss Yellen and the crew <laughs> back in the conversation again. Now that we're post, uh, not post earnings, but getting through there, and also post uh, election uh, earnings, or excuse me, uh, Fed is on the table again, and we saw a lot of action out there uh, across the rates complex, including uh, action out there uh, in uh, the ten year, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we saw net on the week of the ten year off by about oh about a point point and a half or so out there, depending on where you're looking out there in the term structure of volatility, kind of kind of unched net on the week. Uh, similar stuff out here from a skew perspective. That's net skew. Remember, uh, that's not the old uh, quick skew breakdown. I'll leave that for Nick to uh, to dive into a little bit deeper. By the way, if you like the quick skew, we're thinking about putting out. Some cool little items and alerts for that on you throughout the week. So stay tuned for those. Those are kind of that's a kind of a fun tool, and it is kind of interesting to to look and see how these things are, are breaking down. Uh, sometimes that said, it was a strong week uh, from an overall open interest perspective, up nearly a quarter <laughs> this past week. So sizable, sizable gains over the past week. I'm sure there's some uh, behind the scene machinations we can get into that in a little bit, but why that number is so strong. Uh, but in general, up about 643,000 contract. That's a sizable, sizable chunk, and a lot of that, a lot of that paper about quarter of a million of that, a little bit more coming in the Dece contract, which had nearly 60% of the paper out there, again, indicating kind of what we're talking about, uh, Fed juicing up the markets here a little bit. And uh, the action, if you're wondering, you know, where was the action out here? It was on the put side pretty heavily, and it was uh, pretty much the 125 half puts were number one with a bullet out here. You know, we talk about some of these other products. Uh, these things do 2,000, 3,000, 9,000 contracts. This is <laughs> the 125F puts out here in Dece doing over a quarter of a million contracts uh, last week just in that one option, that one strike alone. Uh, about uh, pretty uh, pretty fairly distributed with, with the exception of today, today being the light day. 60,000 on Monday, about nearly 50,000 on Tuesday, nearly 90 on Wednesday, and 50 again on Thursday, only about 17,000 today. Total of about 264. And of that Monday options, it's kind of interesting, about nearly 30,000 of that was opening. A lot of closing on the rest of the week, though, so about nearly, nearly 30,000 again, closing, closing the next day. So kind of interesting to watch this open interest kind of flow uh, back and forth out here. And number two, also with the bull it's a pretty impressive bullet where uh, the Dece 124 puts going out here with about a little bit less than a quarter of a million, about 221,000 on the week. Again, the lion share the big day coming on Wednesday, about 87,000, almost exactly equal paper here to the 125 half puts and 124, maybe a vertical uh, going up on that day. I'll have to dig in a little bit and check that out. But again, opening on Monday, closing a lot of the rest of the week and a fairly light day out there as well and the number three if you weren't done with the puts and you said what comes in between 124 and 125 half you said what about the 125s well those were lighting it up as well about 187,000 of those bad boys going off this week with about 65,000 of that coming on Monday again 
uh, substantially opening on Monday and then also opening a bit on Wednesday as well, 53,000 contracts. So kind of interesting to watch how this paper flow unfolded out here during the week. We don't get a chance to talk about rates a lot. I know, Nick, this is kind of uh, back in your neck of the woods. You're an old school Euro dollars guy. So this stuff is uh, is near and dear uh, to your heart, but it is kind of interesting to see just the kind of the numbers. It just puts into perspective. You know, we talk about something like a lean hog, something else, like even like a silver, it doesn't, you know, a few hundred, a few thousand contracts on a given strike. And now we're talking a quarter of a million on just a single strike uh, on just the puts alone, not even the calls. Uh, it's just, uh, it's a totally different beast uh, from a volume perspective and shows some of the liquidity that's available in some of these products out here once you start playing out in these realms. That said, I know Nick. You've been looking at a lot of cool stuff. I think you may even have a suggestion. I won't I won't spoil it for you. No spoilers here. But you may have something that caught your eye in terms of a crazy trade of the week. Is that right, sir? Yeah, so we'll uh we'll jump over to that in a minute, but I think a couple things to sort of piggyback on what you had to say. So one thing that's going to be coming down the pike from uh, Quick Strike and it will be available and is available if you're a CME Direct user and you look at the integration with Quick Strike and I believe it's going to be out there soon enough in regular quick strike and potentially out there in free quick strike. But there's the ability to look at the block trades rather easily um, that are going up for these different uh, benchmark products. And uh, as I was scanning through the blocks for this week, we're seeing, you know, when you see chunky stuff trading on here. So if I go back to uh, 14th, which is uh, a Monday, um, you know, you saw 47,000 of uh, 100 and or or the 40 of the 125 puts traded in the December contract, and then 26,000 in the 128 calls uh, for January. And then on Wednesday, there were uh, 30,000 of the 124 puts and another, um, you know, for the deck and, and another 7,500 um, for uh, the 125 and a half puts. And then, you know, you, there's, there's just tremendous uh, uh, numbers that go up on the blocks. And that's why you see such a, uh, such big numbers. Here's a here's a here's a combo that traded 123, 129 uh, uh, combo in in January, uh, thirty thousand. So when you see that kind of thing happen on the blocks, those don't even hit the market. You know, you can you can imagine where all that volume's coming from, right? So uh, a couple things to point out in here. So we're looking at, um, you know, we're looking at uh, uh, the December, and and if you look like Mark said, that one twenty five and a half put a quarter of a million uh, in terms of volume traded this week. Um, and and the, the most interesting part that I see from uh, from the TWIO report is that if you take a look and you see what happened to the, the put call ratio, it was one, you know, basically 1.1 last week. Now it's 0.8485 now, which it's like a 21% change. So there was, it went from being very kind of equal to, you know, the puts getting closed out and the calls getting, um, back in the market there, right? So when you have puts over calls, the number is going to get smaller as there's less puts, right? So that's the big thing I'm seeing. You see that change both in uh, the December and the January contract. You see a little bit of opposite in the Feb, but that one really doesn't have too much open interest, so I don't really pay too much attention to that. But specifically in the December, so a lot of put closing, and so there could have been some profit taking on the breaks there, and then a lot of call opening, meaning people getting back in the market as I'm imagining a lot of people think this is oversold from a from a change in yield standpoint. And the, the other important thing, and, and a lot of times, you know, you talk in the, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily understand what these strikes mean other than, um, you know, the numbers that they represent. So, yeah, the 10 years trading, you know, whatever it is right now, what is it, uh, 125 and a half, 125 and a half, basically. But what does that mean? So generally speaking, you know, the, the people that are looking at this product, they're looking at what the yield is on, on the strike. So what's the yield associated? So each futures, future has a, a cheapest to deliver a note or bond that it's tied to. So, and that, that note or bond has a yield. So the, the range of strikes from a yield perspective that traded this week are from one and a half percent to two and a quarter percent. So, uh, so it's going to go, the yield's going to go lower as the future goes higher. So that's like the 130, roughly about the 130, 130 half strike is a, a one and a half percent yield. And the 124 half strike is like a two and a quarter percent yield. So when people are trading treasuries, they're thinking of what that 10 year note yield is. So that's really how um, it starts to, you know, that's where the trade kind of um, initiates itself is what am I, what am I expecting from an inflation standpoint? So with all the calls that are opening and all the puts that are closing, my guess would be that there's people are thinking that um, the yield should go a little lower from where it is, meaning it, it might've risen a little bit much after this, after the Trump 
and the election stuff that settled in. So keep an eye on the on the Treasury futures this week, especially given the way that the, the positions have uh, has sort of not flipped, but had a significant change in the put call ratio. Now, for our crazy trade of the week uh, at this point, if we go all the way out there to April, which really probably just came on the board um, this not too long ago. I'm not exactly sure what date. It could have even been this week. But I, I'll, I'll put our crazy trade of the week as the 102 puts out there. And I don't even know what that yield is. So that that would be a really, really uh, a much higher um, – a much higher yield than I think uh, that's like a Armageddon yield. Uh, I believe that there's real problems with uh, our uh, debt issues and that kind of thing. So the 102 puts traded on the downside or on the upside for yield. And then we also see the 150 strike, which is on the downside of the yield traded as well. So those open. So crazy trade. That's way out there. That's a lot of points, even though we moved a lot of points um, over the course of, uh, of this last uh, uh, week or week or two. Um, it's still, um, pretty significant in terms of how far out on the strike curve that is. Yeah, that needs like but, a, an apocalyptic <laughs> type yeah, move in order crazy. for that to pay off. Reminds, me, crazy trade. reminds me of like, crazy. you know, blasting out like a 600 put in the SPX. You know, if we get down there, there's a lot of other issues going on, you know, you have to worry about before, you have to worry about paying off on those puts. And maybe uh, maybe our friend here is something thinking something similar here uh, from a yield equivalent on, on these puts. Yeah, a little a little bit out there. Uh, it's but but that's the fun of the report. So you can if there's something that's a little that's active, that's kind of way out there and you could see it right away. And uh, whether or not we make the free one interactive or not, that remains to be seen. But we might activate some of those links so you li links so you can dive in and take a look and see actually what traded on what day. So uh, we're thinking about that as well. But but it's I think it's always important for us to kind of keep an eye on the rates now, especially right as we get toward that form C in, in December, as they're going to probably make a decision. So we'll watch the 10 years going to sort of be our inflationary watch along with the long bond. But 10 years more interesting. And then as we look to see what the Fed's going to do, we'll keep an eye on the euro dollars. But there's so much that could get lost in the shuffle of the euro dollars because the numbers are so gigantic and the, really the ranges are sort of set by the Fed funds and where people expect them to be. But the 10 years fun to watch because you can see, um, you know, if you're really looking for liquidity, there's plenty of places to trade in the interest rate sector. Yeah, I think liquidity is the, is the story out there. People have been lamenting uh, for a long time a lot of the popular you know, equity option products. Hey, liquidity is kind of drying up. It's not here where I want it to be. They're looking a little bit farther afield. Uh, if you're not looking in the rates complex, you're missing out, at least from a liquidity perspective, as well as for some funky trades. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that one. Maybe we'll flag that, Nick, to, to come back to that on a later date. Maybe we'll talk to some rates guys and see maybe exactly what it would take <laughs> for a trade like that to uh, to have to pay off. Kind of interesting. Let's move on to another area, a similar side of the coin, not rates, but it tends to move around Fed time. Uh, it's, of course, the shiny stuff. Good old gold, uh, the gold apocalypse. <laughs> call it what you will. Uh, continuing this week, uh, off another about 15, 16 percent out there in the big uh, COMEX gold futures off, They're closing around about 15 handles off or so, pretty much across the board around uh, 12, 10, 12, 15, depending on where you're looking. Uh, so yeah, not another yet another bad week for the gold bulls. You know, we were we were flirting around with 1300 levels not too long ago. Looking at those uh, those risk reversals and strangles coming into play, the 13, 1400. Now we're uh, we're flirting with south <laughs> of the 1200 level uh, pretty soon. So pretty aggressively. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the calls were leading the dance from a volatility perspective, and so this protracted sell-off has been moving us into a, a relatively cheaper volatility range if this continues that probably won't hold up we'll see those puts starting to get an aggressive bid but at least for this week vol coming off fairly aggressively off about anywhere from two to over three and of course i won't look at that front essentially weekly contract now because volatility is a meaningless concept out there uh, but a little bit farther out about a month or so into jan uh, and you'll see about three three and a half points out there coming off from a vol perspective so vol really uh, really getting smoked out there again depending on where you're looking uh, let's just pull up the quick skew really really quickly i can't i can't help myself i like playing around with this tool uh, all the time we saw yeah a little bit of a spike coming in the calls uh but uh the puts uh giving up the ghost and uh, apparently netting out to the downside kind of interesting uh we'll move out here to where the action was overall open interest strong for this, this week not quite as strong as we saw in the 10 year but still fairly robust up about five and a half percent or a little over 43,000 contracts this week. Uh, a little bit shy of half of that amount, about 47% coming 
in that Dece front month or really, you know, front week, less than four days to go uh, contract out here. And if you're asking where was the action yet again, I talked about it before. Uh, people like these round, even strikes out here in a lot of products, including gold. And we saw that play out again this week out here in gold with the 1,200 puts uh, leading it by a country mile. Even, you don't see this very often, an even exact 17,000 of these 1,200 puts uh, lighting it up this week. Uh, pretty fairly evenly split uh, throughout the week as well with the Lions. A good chunk, about a little over a third coming on Tuesday, about 5,200. And then uh, pretty even amounts throughout the rest of the week uh, going up there. Then it drops off substantially to number two to the 11 half puts so the even more dire less optimistic puts out there also lighting it up but about 50 percent of the volume about 8800 contracts going up out there the lion's share of those almost uh, almost all of that actually come in on monday 5400 coming on monday with a good half of that opening so kind of interesting to see a lot of activity there then we fall off yet again for number three uh, the call is getting a little bit of love, not a ton this week, as you might imagine, but still a little bit of love, about 7,000 of these uh, Dece 12 half calls, uh, lighting it up uh, fairly evenly split with the lion's share actually coming on Tuesday, about 2,300 on of that total of nearly 7,000. A lot of that opening throughout the week, so kind of interesting there. But yeah, it wasn't the calls. Calls not the story of the week this week. It was definitely the puts in particular, uh, that 1,200 put yet again, Mr. Nick. These uh, even levels out here, these even strikes uh, tend to fascinate uh, and aggregate a lot of liquidity around them. And we saw that yet again this week out here in the shiny stuff. Anything else catching your eye, including uh, some of that interesting volatility movement out here in gold this week? Yeah, I think, uh, I think again, I'm, gonna, I'm taking a look at, now I'm taking a look at the open interest chart. And when we look at the open interest chart, our max OI strike is the 1200 strike for the January contract. And you know, as you mentioned, that was our high volume strike as well. And on uh, below that, we have 1175 and 1150. So you can kind of write off those nickel, not nickel, like those those fin strikes, those five dollar strikes. Um, uh, so it, at least when you start looking at the big uh, big changes or the or the the spikes in the open interest. But I think what catches my eye in the in the January contract of uh, if if nothing else is the fact that you really didn't get a tremendous amount of trade below the 1200 strike when it comes to you know um the the, the leaders in volume so um you know you saw some 1100s trade that was the lowest that went uh from anything significant but you know i still and, and i've said this all along and again i always preface my statements with i'm the casual observer and i'm purely looking at numbers and ranges and stuff like that but feels like a bottom in gold. You know, we've kind of had a lot of reactions to what the expectations were after the election. And, you know, we, if you look at this January volatility, it's on the low end of its range in a long time again. Uh, it came in this week after being up a little bit last week. Um, the skew is uh, a, a little bit to the put side, right? That's why we have a negative number, but you'll, you're seeing how um, I put out uh, the quick skew for it. It kind of crossed paths, right? So uh, the call cr crossed across the call crossed the put. So the put went above the at the money, and the call went below or around the at the money. So so there's a little bit of a teetering tottering over there um, uh, in the volatility curve. So something to keep an eye on, and uh, and you can see from that chart that that has crossed back and forth, but um, it tends to have, or at least it has since. Uh, uh, early February where the call was bid over the put. So might want to keep an eye on that kind of stuff. But for you, I'm going to say the same thing. Not a lot of that, that I've said over the last few weeks, um, not a lot of strikes trading below the 1200, at least in the January, I'll take a look real quick in the Feb, which is our next best open interest. And you see there's some stuff trading, but not, you know, again, 1050 strike is the lowest, but there's really not much volume there. So feels like a bottom from a future standpoint to me. Uh, if that's the case and volatility is low, I'm going to say what I always say. I like puts. I like hedge puts. And um, and if you are not comfortable being straight up uh, along the puts, then maybe do a put spread or maybe you can do a combo uh, where you sell some calls to finance it, but sell some way upside ones if you get a little bit out there. Um, but I still like I still like the volatility here, and I still uh, think we're in the, the bottom part of a range. Uh, and if we do break this range, again, just from a logical standpoint, then vol should go up, right? If we continue to go through the 1200, so you're going to own some 1200 puts. You can even buy puts below that, you know, and hedge them. That's probably a, a better from a premium deal standpoint, but, um, you know, we break 
significantly below 1200 at 1150 you're going to see vol pop and you're going to see whatever you purchase down there going to be of value so uh that's that's sort of what's catching the eye for me today not a lot below the 1200 strike in terms of trade um there is stuff open interest wise but not a lot of trade this week and it feels like a bottom from a future standpoint and i think it's a buy from a volatility standpoint yeah i i kind of concur with you there at least from uh, expecting uh, if we keep heading, trending lower like i mentioned particularly breaking through that psychological 1200 level I, I would be surprised if we didn't see vol pop if we didn't see uh, the put wing get even more life than it has and uh, see vol kind of up across the board that's kind of the you know, you can only follow the skew curve for so long before things have to break. And uh, that's probably at the point where we'll be seeing now. You're right. But if we rebound, then you're right. Then ball will come in. Uh, but if we continue this this downside, particularly to uh, the 12 through the 1200 level, I think those puts you're right could be could be uh, attractive and fairly juicy. All right, let's keep on rolling. You guys like to hit us up with your questions. So we'll see if we can squeeze a few of those in in our futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app. Available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, you heard the man. Time to hit us up with those questions. We got a bunch coming in, so let's hit, uh, let's hit some of these now. All right, uh, yeah, we got a few minutes. We can hit some of these. Let's go for this first one, Big Jack. Nice, uh, nice straightforward question. He asks, how important are the futures when pricing the options? Should I pay attention uh, to the term structure? One very important B, yes. Uh, <laughs> no, we'll get a little bit more in depth than that. Uh, but yeah, you know, people will come into this from a stock world, perhaps, and that kind of mentality uh, are not used to this kind of notion of, you know, using the futures to price up these contracts and having different prices throughout the term structure. The use of Apple, Apple's trading at whatever it is. There's no, there's no differential there. Uh, if it's Apple's at 100, then it's at 100, and that's what you price the options off of, regardless of the month. Uh, you know, of course, you have other things to factor in volatility, time, essentially, but. The stock is the stock. Futures, different beast. I mean, we're talking about it here on the show all the time. Uh, depending on where you look on the term structure, you're getting different prices, different volatility levels, different hot options. So it's a different beast depending on where you're looking. So obviously the first thing is to, to find the option that corresponds to the future or vice versa, the future that corresponds to the option you're looking at. And make sure you're looking at the right one because we get questions on that all the time. Why is this thing some sort of pricing discrepancy and we have to explain to them no no you're looking at the wrong future you're looking at the wrong option uh, there's a lot a lot of that still going on out there i think some of that could be probably fixed with a little bit a little bit easier a little bit less opaque uh, and a little bit less arcane symbology on the futures option side but they're getting there baby steps they just did it on the equity options world a big symbology overhaul i think it still has some work to go there but definitely some room to go on the futures options side some of these symbols a little bit impenetrable to the to the newcomer uh but yeah futures obviously huge in pricing the options and the term structure is going to dictate how all these things that also answers your questions you guys send in this all the time why is this particular option in this month so much more expensive than this one the month before it or vice versa Look at the term structure. That's usually 99% of the time uh, the answer to that question. Anything to add here, uh, Mr. Nick from the Global Nay Interstellar HQ? Well, I put out a gold term structure for, some, for everybody to take a look at. And there's also uh, the term structure is out there for free on the CME Group website. So if you go to cmegroup.com slash quickstrike, and then you'll see a vol term structure tool that is available for your use as well. Uh, yeah, obviously futures are op very important, right? When it comes to pricing your, uh, uh, your options. Yeah. The term structure, you know, you can look at that as, as, as you likely mentioned, Mark, um, as an idea of what they think vol is going to do as, as, uh, as time marches on. Right. Uh, another way to look at it is to, is to sort of, uh, get an idea if things are priced, accurately relative to each other. So if you see uh, dips and doodles in the vol term structure, you might want to take a look at those dips 
and th those high and low points and see if there's uh, any particular reason for that happening or if there might be some uh, way for you to take advantage of that. But uh, at term I think that Mark mentioned you want to you want to make sure where you're trading on the curve. Right. But uh, um, typically in a lot of these commodity products, you don't want to go too far out on the term structure because a lot of the liquidity exists, as we always talk about, on the front end of the curve. Right. So you can look at uh, Twio, Twifo and see where that open interest is. You can look at the open interest tools out there. You can look at the term structure and and use all those to decide which ones you want to uh, to use to trade. And Mark, to answer your question um, about what's tied to what from uh, from a um, from an underlying standpoint, if you are. And uh, a quick strike essentials free user or any quick strike level user in the quick edu section there under contract specs you can go and see the expirations all the symbols and then what underlying future they're tied to so you'll see the when the future expires and also when the when the uh, option expires as well so yes it is a little bit cryptic when you go to the exchange sites they don't always tell you what what options tied up to what future but within quick strike you can get that very easily and if you ever want that anybody ever wants to see it just tweet us and we'll we'll push out a list and we'll you can save it because we have, you know, three or four years worth of uh, expirations out there. So we'll always be able to follow it uh, fairly easily. So uh, keep that in mind. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the day when all these exchanges start stop pushing out like, you know, LOJ7. They start pushing out the actual, you know, what the contract is just to, I know that'll make people's lives so much easier out there who are trying to come. I mean, that's been a big push on futures options for so long is trying to get more retail to embrace them. So little changes like that, I think. Uh, could go a long way you know people who've been in the business for a long time you were in the in the futures options pits over there at cme i was on you know spx side uh, those symbols aren't as impenetrable to us they seem kind of normal and maybe we see we, we we don't see the matrix we don't see the code we see the matrix other people see the code and <laughs> it's kind of uh it's kind of daunting to them they don't want to see that you know so i think it's some steps that could be, could be taken there that said let's move on uh, let's see we got a time for a couple more here let's go to this one from from anthony good old anthony wheeler here Ah, he got a straightforward one, too. A lot of straightforward questions this week. I like it. Uh, what is the most liquid futures options product? I'm going to assume we're going to limit it to, like, domestic stuff here and what we're trading to, like, CME and stuff. Those are the big liquid domestic ones. There's some funky ones around the world, like Kospi and some of the rebar stuff over there in, like, in, like, uh, in China and stuff. There's funky contracts. We won't get into those. Uh, and they also, the, you get, when you start comparing, it's not really apples to apples because a contract is not a contract is not a contract. Some of the notional value on some of these contracts is, is pretty paltry compared to some of these big contracts that do a lot more notional value. So there's a lot of ways we could parse this. But that said, contract-wise, I don't know, Nick, you're an old-school Eurodollar guy. Uh, is there anything that holds a candle out there to your dollars these days? Uh, I am. Well, right now we look, if we just, let's look at the, at the E mini S and P 500, right? So the current open interest on that, and it's up 18% across the board is about 4 million in the options contract. Yeah, so about, okay? about a fifth. <laughs> yeah. So that's pretty good. And then if we go over to the Euro dollars, um, you know, the options open interest over there is just, Right, like it's almost 38 million. So um, with 8 million being in the front month, now keep in mind, you know, you, you, yeah, 8 million in the front month, but the December contract, you, you really gotta be, you gotta sort of be a specialist when you trade that that front contract in the euro dollars because it doesn't move that much. You gotta be really careful. The delta, the delta on your options changes tremendously and you don't really move, have a whole lot of range of strikes. So we're going to, we could write that one off, but even in that, the next contract has two and a half million, but, and then uh, I'll, I'll go even further and you, you could take a look and we talked about it already. We can go out to, um, uh, you know, the treasuries, treasuries has almost 4 million open interest in the 10 year. Okay. So if you're looking from a liquidity standpoint, you're probably going Euro dollars, but then you can pull off some of those, uh, some of those contracts that are a little bit more difficult to trade and you're still pretty good. But, you know, if you're looking for, you know, liquidity with some obvious advantages to being able to get good prices, you, you got the 10 year and you have the, the S and P and uh, the, the S and P E mini contract. So, and, and the other ones, they're not quite as big, you know, crude it trades, it's liquid. But yeah, from a from a from a largest contract standpoint, always going to be your dollars. Then you're going to look at the treasuries and then you jump into the equities, the equity indexes. Yeah, just for like a point of comparison, you gave them the S&P, like the WTI is somewhere. I think it was up this week, somewhere around two million contracts total uh, open interest. So, yeah, just a different level when you're talking the euro dollars and WTI is active. And we talk about it a lot and there's a lot going on out there. But uh, 
Uh, gee, I just, it's hard to compare to the Leviathan <laughs> that is Euro dollars. All right, one more here. This comes from GK, GK6. He or perhaps she, just simple question again, what's your fav favorite thing to trade? Um, I'm, I'm going to limit this to futures options because this is a futures options show, obviously. Uh, and, you know, Nick, I got to say, I've been kind of lured to the dark side of crude over the past year to year and a half, you know, all the activity out there, the the, the vacillating skew, uh, the reliable setups out there for a while there where it was very attractive from a bullish risk reversal standpoint where you could sell out of the money puts for fairly attractive levels, buy out of the money calls for fairly cheap levels. Uh, and that was very attractive for quite some time. So I was lured into kind of that setup. That's, that's one of my favorite types of trade anyway, the old bullish risk reversal. So it's lining up in a way that's attractive to me on an underlying where I have a particular outlook on. It was pretty attractive. That setup is less attractive now. As we mentioned, of course, uh, you know, the front month calls getting a little bit more of a bid out there. So you can't buy the cheapy calls you needed anymore. So if you wanted to have that bullish outlook, then that was not the attractive thing you could do. The puts are still juicy, so you could still go that route if that, if that was if that was your your flavor of the week, or maybe even if you are a daring fellow, uh, like lean into a strangle instead and take advantage of uh, the juice maybe on both sides. But uh, yeah, I have to say in terms of what I've traded the most uh, out here, it's got to be WTI, probably followed by gold and gold in all of its formats, not just the COMEX. I'll, I'll you know we'll do some GLD and others too. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can trade the metals, but definitely I'd have to say those two probably have done the, the most volume in not not of course counting my old you know uh, S and P futures and options days that was that was as a professional I'm talking more now uh, on the on the content and and recent side so so I won't count that so you can't count euro dollars either there Nick yeah no I would have I would have discounted it I mean clearly because I, I know that product the best. Um, but uh, just from a, a current standpoint, I just like the way gold's acting from a, from a trader's perspective. I just think there's, you know, it, you, you can ask people that trade out there, and there's people who tend to like trading from the long side, and there's people who like tend to trading from the short side. And I think you have to learn to do both, obviously, um, uh, to to be successful. But, you know, I think that there's opportunities in, in that market to do it from both sides because you have uh, a wide enough range where you can get short some premium from a strangle standpoint a wide enough range where you can do some risk reversals like Mark talked about and in both directions and uh, uh, an, uh, you know, a reasonable, a reasonable level of volatility, at least at this point where you can trade and, and uh, not get crucified on a, on a, on a, on a vol getting beaten up a little bit and have a chance to actually make some money on a move and vol going up and not just kind of, um, you know, a lot of times you'll get long options and you'll get a move and you'll get no value out of that. And I think the, that gold ball right now is low enough where uh, you can get a move and um, even move into an old range and not get hurt that much, meaning your delta will actually work for you uh, in terms of covering your uh, covering your uh, uh, premium if you're doing it the right way. So I like gold right now myself. Yeah, gold in terms of examples of, uh, you know, like we said before in the show, a variable skew, a type of skew that's going to move around quite a bit. Uh, if that's what's attractive to you, then you're right. It's kind of hard to beat gold out there right now. We, WTI was fairly stable for the better part of two years in terms of a skew. It's, it's evolved a little bit in the last few months, but for a long time, it was a similar setup. Gold is kind of all over the place depending on the week. So if that's attractive to you, that's a good place to go. If that's terrifying to you, <laughs> then uh, maybe you stay clear of the shiny stuff. There we go. Can't go out without that music. Waiting for that hook to kick in. There we go. Now we got the funk back in the show. Unfortunately, that's all the time we got for this episode of this week in futures options. I kind of just want to tune out, listen to the music for a little bit. Maybe I'll do that after the show. Got to close it up first. Uh, but before we go, as always, let me check back in with my cohort here, my partner in crime. See what's cooking over there in the Quick Strike International, nay, Interstellar HQ. What's coming down the pike, Mr. Nick? Take it away, sir. Okay, so what's coming on the pike? So we are, uh, it is Friday, November 18th, if you're listening on recording. This weekend, there'll be a new build out there, so there'll be some good stuff in the freebie zone out on Quick Strike Essentials. And also some nice additions if you are CME Direct user and you look at the integrated version of Quick Strike, you're going to see some good stuff out there from uh, a block trade, visualization standpoint, uh, market scanning uh, standpoint, uh, as well as some other reports. So uh, if you're not on direct, 
get on direct because there's a lot of free stuff that you can get at and that's updated uh, live uh, volatilities and uh, the ability to look at trades uh, directly from the interface. So take a look and that integration is getting better and better. And as far as uh, other CME group related quick strike stuff, um, there'll be some new reports coming out here uh, before the end of the year, um, probably some scan reporting stuff. And uh, and if you uh, if you ever go out there to the, to the tradingfloor.com, which is a Saxo Bank website, you should see some good benchmark uh, visualization tools out there as well coming from uh, uh, your friends over at Quick Strike. So some good things, uh, some good things happening, some new releases. I think after this next release, we'll, we'll take a little bit of a break uh, and kind of clean up a few messes here internally. But then uh, after the new year, you should see a sort of a, a, a trickle slash uh, a mini uh, little like uh, water pouring down the stairs in terms of new stuff coming out, um, both free and subscription level. There you go. Check it out. Kick the tires over there. CMEgroup.com slash Twio to see the reports. And if you want to upgrade, CMEgroup.com slash QuickStrike to get a login at least. You can still use the essentials there. And then you could go forth and prosper. Use the free stuff. You can use it for a long time. Uh, there's no, uh, no, no time limit on that. And then you want to upgrade, go forth and check out the quick skew, all the other cool stuff we're talking about here on the show on a regular basis. And on behalf of Mr. Nick and indeed myself, I thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, subscribing. Sending in such great kind of on-the-nose questions this week. I like those. Sometimes it mixes them up. You know, straightforward, to the point, very pithy. I like that. Keep those coming, and we'll see you next time right here on Twifo this week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike, options pricing and analysis software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered. With market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility, QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X dot com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com.